Soapbox. I'm Russell Conti. Today I'm going to show you how to make a double welt pocket. So without further ado, let's get to it. Picture on screen are the tools that will help you to achieve success with your double welt pocket. First and foremost is a good quality pair of scissors. These are relatively short, however I like them quite a bit because they have thick chunky blades so I can cut through multiple layers of fabric, and they also have sharp points so I can clip directly and all the way to the points. They're manufactured by a company named Ginger, G-I-N-G-H-E-R, and they're referred to as Taylor's Points or Craft Scissors, five inches long. Next on the list are pins. These are referred to as flower head pins. I like them because they're easy to manage, easy to hold on to. They have a long shaft that's very fine and a sharp, sharp point. So when I'm trying to pin layers of fabric together, I can successfully, and if I need to, I can weave them in a couple of times. Holds them more stable. These are manufactured by a company named Clover, C-L-O-V-E-R. I like their products quite a bit. They make a lot of notions, and if you're not certain what notions to purchase and you see equal things or things that appear to be equal, Clover is always your best bet. They always make a great quality product. This is a waxed tailor's chalk. The benefit to the waxed tailor's chalk is that I can transfer markings on the fabric, and once I'm done with them, I can heat them with the iron and they magically disappear. However, every once in a while they don't magically disappear, so test your fabric first to verify. If they don't move it disappear, then find a non-waxed version. Again, Clover carries one of those as well. A thimble is helpful. This is a tailor's thimble. It's got an open on the top, and we typically put it on our middle finger or our ring finger. It's simply a matter of preference. Seam ripper, this is a fancy one my mother purchased for me some time ago. And of course, you never make mistakes, but I make mistakes all the time, so in case, you'll have that handy. You'll want some basting thread. We're gonna baste these weld pieces to the pocket before we actually sew them so that they don't shift on us. Basting thread is a thick, heavy thread, typically made of cotton, and the benefit is it's got a glaze on it that allows it to move through the fabric very easily. I've already threaded up a needle here, and of course you're gonna need a hand needle for the basting thread. And then you need a construction thread. I like to use polyester for the most part, but you can use cotton as well, you can use silk. It's a matter of personal preference, just use a good quality thread. For the demonstration, I'm going to actually use white thread so that the stitches show up better while I'm sewing, or you can see me sewing. If I used a thread color that matched, it would be hard to see on screen. I brought out these three colors of gray because oftentimes, when you're trying to match fabric, you can't get an identical match. And so what we really need is a value of thread that kind of blends into the background. So in my arsenal of threads, I have a whole bunch of different variations of gray and browns and beiges. And so that way, I can actually take my thread I can arrest it onto the fabric. And as long as it blends into the background, it's going to be a safe choice for construction. In that case, that one seems to work pretty well. The light gray might be a value that's just a little bit too light. Yeah, it's going to pop up on the gray. So I wouldn't want to use that one unless I was trying to create some contrast. It's always better to go darker than lighter if you're trying to blend. And so here's a dark thread. And that one actually might work quite successfully as well. When you're doing hand sewing, you'll want something to condition the thread. This is referred to as thread heaven. I'm not certain that it's still manufactured. It's a silicone-based product, but you can also use beeswax, used all the time. And what that does is just condition the thread so that it doesn't tangle and twist as much, and it makes it easier to go through the fabric when you're using it. Now that we've gone over the tools, let's go over the pieces we need to construct the double weld pocket. First, we need to know how wide we want to complete. For my sample, I wanted to finish it five and a half inches wide. So I put a thread tack, right there and right there to show me the ends of the welt. And a thread tack is simply taking a thread, running it through there and clipping it very short. Then what I did is I transferred a marking in between to show me exactly where the opening is gonna be with my tailor's chalk. And I leave a long line that is perpendicular right at the ends so I can see that really clearly on both sides. When we sew this welt, it's very important that we sew right to that line and not beyond it on both sides. Once we determine that, we also want to interface or stabilize this portion of the garment or the pocket. We put a piece of interfacing on the back, and that's going to be cut a half inch longer on either end, so one inch longer, about two inches wide, and we're going to just heat set that in place. Now I want you to notice right here there's a little bubble in the interfacing, and it wouldn't seem like it would make a very big deal. However, that can actually read through to the front of the fabric, so if you ever have that happen, make certain you get rid of those. We also need our welts, and our welts are going to be cut one and three quarter inches 
wide by six and a half inches long, just an inch longer than our finished pocket. The bottom one, we want to overlock that edge or put a binding tape on it in some fashion. It wants to be finished. That's gonna sew here eventually, and it's gonna sew face down at a quarter inch away from the opening. The upper welt would sew in the same fashion on the other side, again, a quarter inch away from the opening. Now we also need our pocket bag. And the pocket bag back, this is the one that when I open the pocket, I could see, I'm just gonna make it out of self. It's gonna be cut in the same width as the welt itself, so in half of an inch larger, side to side, than my pocket opening. And in the pocketing fabric, this reduces bulk. It's gonna be cut the same size, and it's gonna be on the front. Eventually, we'll trim it at the bottom so that they match up. I like my pockets to be about six and a half to seven inches in length before they're sewn so that they complete at about six to six and a half inches. I like a deep pocket. So let's get to it. Step one of this process, now that we've marked everything, is we want to place our welts. We're going to place the lower welt on the bottom side of the opening, making certain it extends a half inch on either side. Again, we want this bottom edge to be overlocked and we want to baste this in place. We're going to sew it at a quarter of an inch, but we want to hold it in place so it doesn't shift. Now you can pin baste if you like, or you can thread baste. Thread basting typically is more successful. I've prepared my basting thread and needle. I need to place a knot at the thread tail. What I do is I hold that between my index finger and my thumb. I cross the needle where I want the knot to form, and I wrap the needle three or four times. I pinch that wrap, and I push the needle through, and I continue to pinch it all the way to, down until it terminates and magically a knot appears. Okay. So what we're gonna do is take this and I'm going to start basting. Now basting is just a temporary stitch that's a long stitch. It doesn't have to be attractive. It simply needs to hold the layers together. Some people like to thread based right on the stitch line. I like to stitch thread based close to the stitch line. That way it's easier to pull out once I've completed my final stitching by machine. Don't pull too snug. We don't want to draw up the fabric. And I'm using my thimble to deflect the needle when I'm going through so that I don't injure myself. And there we are. And the bottom one is thread basted. We're ready to do the same for the top. I'm going to turn it toward myself so I have better access. Again, face down. I'll create my knot one more time. And we'll base this into place. And at the very end, if you're concerned about the thread basting coming out, what we can do is we simply take one stitch and then back stitch one time. And that keeps the thread from pulling out while we are working with it. Great. Now we're ready for the sewing machine, but we want to take one more step. Right where these endings are, okay, where those white lines are, the markings, we want to transfer those to this side of the welt. So there's my marking there. I'm going to transfer it here so I can see it. And my marking on this side. I need to know where those end places are so that I don't overshoot them when I'm sewing. We're ready to go. So we're going to set our fabric on the machine. We're going to bring our presser foot down, make sure it aligns nicely with that raw edge that we're sewing. And I like to start in from my starting place, just a little bit, about three stitches. And I like to back up to where it needs to end. I also like to decrease my stitch length a bit. So if a standard stitch length is two millimeters, I might drop it down to 1.8 or 1.6 to start and stop. It just makes the stitch more stable. So I'm going to take a few stitches back first and stop. And then I'm going to come forward.
let the sewing machine do the work for you. Don't overdrive the machine. Now when we get to the end, where that line is, I'm going to take one stitch to the line, and then I'm going to back up again. Then cut my threads. Raise the presser foot and check my work. Again, I want to start forward on my stitches a little bit. And my goal is to back up to that former stitch I created. So I'm going to back up just a few stitches. And maybe one more. There we go. Now we're ready to go forward. I'm going to sew the same position that the last stitches were made on the former weld, and I'm going to back up. I think I'm a stitch short, so I'm actually going to go forward one more time. You really want this to be as precise as possible. It will make your life a lot easier once you get ready to construct this. Cut the threads and take it off the machine. I've sewn my two welts in place, one quarter inch away from the edge of the opening. They've concluded right precisely at the ends like they should, and I've backstitched at both ends to make certain they're real stable. On the back side, I've traced some markings just to show you how we're going to cut. Right down the center, we're going to cut between right where the opening should be, and about a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch before the end, I'm going to cut up to the stitching at the corner and then down to the stitching at the bottom corner on both ends. And when I make that cut, I'm gonna cut right to the stitches, but not through them. It's real important that you clip as precisely as possible at this juncture. We can cut from the front or we can cut from the back, but since I know where that opening is from the front, I'm gonna start on the front. I'm gonna go ahead and just catch a portion right at the very center, and then I'm gonna cut between. Again, cut as cleanly as possible. I'm going to stop again about a quarter inch away from the end. Do it on the other side. And stop about a quarter inch away. Now you can either pull this out of the way and clip to that stitching, but it's a little bit hard to see. So it's better, I find, to do it from the back side. I don't want to cut through the welt as well. I just want to capture the fabric and again we're going to clip right to those stitches so you now may not be able to see it in the camera but I'm right at the intersection of that stitch that stitch is the only thing that's stabilizing this at this point if I don't clip right to the stitches when I turn this weld right face forward I'm going to get some bubbling there that I didn't want again right to the stitches other side the same way I want to cut the weld if I can help it. If you do cut the weld, it's not going to be a problem. You just want to avoid it if you can. Right to the stitches. Check your work. And in this case, I'm not quite to it. I want to make certain I'm right to it. That's why those scissors with really sharp points are important. There we go. Now that we've cut open the welt, we're ready to do some pressing. We're going to press up the bottom one, push it up that way. We're going to turn it to the wrong side. And what we want to do is we want to open up those lips right there and press those flat and open. Once we press that lower welt, we're going to bring the welt through. We're just going to pass it through the opening to the back. Are. Now we're going to bring the top weld down like this, turn it over as well. We want to move the lower weld out of our way. Just bring it over here. We're not going to press it. And at this point, we want to go ahead and press that weld open at the top, just like we did before. We want to be careful about this one because we don't want to capture anything else while we're pressing. And 
just pressing that portion. With a little steam is always helpful. Now we have that pressed as well. And we'll bring that to the inside edge. Now that we've pressed the seam allowances open on the welt at the bottom and on the top, we're ready for the next step. And that's simply stabilizing the welts so that they don't move. We're going to do it by hand, although you could also do it by a machine. Now one thing is we still have these little triangles that are open and flipping around. Don't worry about those little triangles at the edges. They'll take care of themselves later on when we get ready to assemble the pocket. Working for the front, and a hand needle and thread, I've already prepared one here, and I'm using white thread simply so it shows up on camera better. We've pressed these seam allowances open, and the benefit to that is that presses that one seam allowance up, and then that creates a barrier against which we can fold our welt against. And so when I'm trying to find the position for it and the placement, I can just use that as my guide. I can feel for it inside. I'm going to go between the layers. I'm going to start my stitch, and I'm going to come up in the ditch. And the ditch simply is where the seam allowance is, or the stitching line is. I'm going to start right at the corner and come up. Now that I've done that, I'm going to take a stitch right next to it in the ditch again, and I'm going to go about a quarter of an inch and capture it and come like that. And we're going to continue the entire process this way, just doing a little catch stitch right there, going dipping in right where the stitch came out, moving forward about a quarter of an inch to the next position, all the while checking this fold to make sure it stays consistent. I want that welt to be really precise. Catch little knots, don't try to pull them through. Just pull back lightly on them. And correct them before you create more grief for yourself. Again, I'm checking my work to make certain that it's even the entire length. And that's why we don't want to press this first. If we press it, we'd really be fighting that crease in order to be able to do this successfully. And there we are, coming right out the point. I'm going to do a little stitch in the back. And I like to bring it through the layers so I don't have a knot there. Take a few stitches in the back to secure it. Pass through the loop. And we're ready to cut it. And leave a little bit of a tail, about a quarter of an inch. You don't want to cut it too close to the knot, otherwise it'll unravel. And our first welt is complete. We'll do the second one the same as the first. Now that those are complete, we're going to go ahead and stitch them together to hold them in place with a little whip stitch. I'm conditioning my thread again because it's a little dry and it's starting to tangle on me. Again, I want to put a knot on the end so it doesn't travel through inadvertently. Cross the tail, wrap the needle, pinch, and hold. There's my knot. the end. Instead of creating a knot, I'm just going to back stitch. That just simply means one more stitch right there, and that should be enough to stabilize that so it doesn't come out later on. I'm going to clip that to get it out of my way. Now that the welts are stabilized and in place, we're ready for the pocket. Now I've cut two pieces of pocket, one for pocketing, of pocketing, and one of self. 
I like to use a full layer of self for the back portion so that if you look into the pocket, you'll be able to see the self through it. And on the front piece, I use pocketing. Now I don't like to use lining. I want to use pocketing because it's very stable and it's also very lightweight so it doesn't print through. I could have sewn this onto the welt before putting the welt in place, but it's extra fabric to deal with. So what I do is I nudge it underneath there about half of an inch. I'm going to pin it in place just through the two layers of the welt and the pocketing. You could also thread baste it if you like, but I want to pin it in place to hold it. And then I'm going to take it over to the sewing machine. I'm going to open this up and I'm going to sew right along the edge of that overlock stitch just to stabilize that. And that portion's ready. Let's go ahead and do it. Once we've sewn the front of the pocket to the bottom weld, we're ready to attach the back pocket. And this is cut from self, and we want that face down. I'm going to match it to the top weld, and you'll notice some excess here. We're going to just trim that away, and I've done that already. If you like, you can also curve these corners just a little bit. It makes for quick sewing. That way, when we come around the corner, we just come right around the corner. This one to match. And go ahead and pin in place. Now that we've pinned the pocket back to the pocket front, we're ready to sew. I'm going to turn this over, peel back one side, and our seam allowance is a half of an inch. Remember those triangles we talked about earlier? We sewed the welt, and when we turned it, we still had these raw triangles I said would resolve themselves later. Well, we're the ones who are going to resolve it, and we're going to resolve that now. At half of an inch at our seam allowance, we're going to go ahead and capture those triangles as we sew across all these layers. Right there, we're going to come down here, we're going to sew the bottom come across the edge, and then we're going to come up the other side. As we come up the side, we're going to capture that triangle as well, and you can sew all the way to the top. Once you've completed that, we'll go and sew the top of the welt to the pocket. Now we're going to fold this away, and that will reveal our stitching when we sewed the welt. Our goal is to sew from edge to edge, right along the edge of that stitching. We don't want to sew right on top of it. If we do sew right on top of it, sometimes we impact the way the welt looks. So we want to sew a couple of stitches away from that stitching line, closer to the raw edge. So we sew from here, across, to here. Some people do this all in one step, and as you get more sophisticated, you can do that as well. So we're going to start at the edge, and I'm not certain the camera will show it, but I'm going to sew close to those stitches, but not on them, because they're just a couple threads away from them. Threads, right the foot. Now that this is sewn, I'm going to go ahead and finish the edges so they don't continue to fray.
On the back, I've overlocked the edges simply to finish them so they didn't ravel over time. Like if it's on the inside of a jacket or a coat, oftentimes they're unfinished. We don't want to recreate additional bulk. I also finished the top here. If I were making a pair of slacks, however, that would have a longer extension right there and it would match right into the waistband. It would get captured by the waistband, so that portion would be inconsequential. We wouldn't have to do that. Hey, thanks for joining me today. I hope you found the information I provided helpful. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to email me. I'm always happy to respond and answer your questions as best I can. My email address is russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L, -S -S at soapbox, S-E-W-P-B-O-X.com. Thanks again for joining me. We'll see you soon.